Good morning, and thank you very much to the organizers for this invitation and for giving me the opportunity to show you the work we've been doing in the epigenetic studies of acute leukemias, primarily AML. Gene expression or gene transcription, and therefore the transcriptional programming of a cell, depends not only on the DNA sequence and the genomic regulation, but also on epigenetic modifications, such as histone modifications and DNA methylation. Under normal circumstances, DNA methylation has a very specific distribution in the cell, with promoter CPG island hypomethylation and hypermethylation and silencing of repetitive elements. However, upon malignant transformation, there is a redistribution of this DNA methylation, and we start observing global hypomethylation with promoter CPG island hypermethylation. These changes lead not only to genomic instability, but also to the aberrant silencing of certain tumor suppressors, as well as the abnormal expression and hypomethylation of certain oncogenes. With this in mind, we hypothesize that these DNA methylation changes are not random, but rather that specific and distinct patterns of DNA methylation would characterize the distinct forms of AML. And that by identifying these aberrant epigenetic patterns in AML, we would understand better the, biology, the biological complexity of the disease, and this would help identify new and clinically relevant disease subtypes. In order to do this, we started a long-term collaboration with a group from Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, and we carried out DNA methylation profiling using microarrays of 344 patients, all of whom were enrolled in clinical trials in the Hovon Multicenter group. Patients were not chosen to over or under represent any subtype of AML, but rather solely on sample availability. We had clinical follow-up available for all these patients and detailed molecular analysis, including cytogenetics, fish, and mutational sequencing. We also included a set of normal CD34 positive cells from the bone marrows of healthy donors as a control. Our first approach was to use unsupervised analysis to see if just by looking at the DNA methylation patterns and without using any other information, we could organize the patients into biologically relevant subtypes. Now, one thing about AML is that there are very specific AMLs with recurrent translocations that we know constitute distinct subgroups. And if our hypothesis about specific patterns was correct, then we would have expected these patients to all group together in specific clusters. So we first looked at the inversion 16s, translocation 821s, 1517s, and MLL abnormalities, and we found that they did, in fact, group in four specific and distinct clusters that were very different from the rest of the AMLs. So this, in a way, supported our initial hypothesis. So believing that epigenetic was giving us clinically relevant subtypes, we started looking in more detail. First thing we looked at was the 821 group. Now this cluster, while significantly enriched for patients carrying the mutation, it also included about 29% of the patients that were negative for the translocation. So what we asked is, is this because they're capturing the similar biological subtype even though the cytogenetics was negative? And when we looked at the clinical outcome as a surrogate for biological, uh, biological phenotype, we find that in fact, patients with and without the translocation that are clustered together based on this epigenetic profile were having exactly the same outcome. And when we looked at the gene expression profiles, they were completely undistinguishable. So in this case, DNA methylation captured information that went beyond the cytogenetics and the gene expression profiling. Another relevant group in AML are AMLs with abnormalities of the CBP alpha transcription factor. Now, as you know, with the new WHO classification, CBP alpha mutations constitute a distinct group. But we now know that there are not only mutations in CBP alpha, there's also abnormal silencing of CBP alpha shown here in the brown block. These patients were clustering separate from patients that had mutations in the gene. 
And this was interesting because patients with silencing of CVP alpha through methylation were indistinguishable from the gene expression profile in a gene expression profiling study carried in this same cohort of patients. So while gene expression was grouping together mutations and methylation of CVP alpha, DNA methylation profiling, on the other hand, was able of separating this group in an unsupervised manner. And when we looked at the differences in methylation patterns between cases in CVP alpha in blue here and cases with CVP alpha mutant in red, we found that CVP alpha silenced AMLs were not only methylated at the CVP alpha locus itself, but they were also hypermethylated in a large cohort of genes. This difference is not trivial since the clinical outcomes of patients with CVP alpha silenced is actually dismal with a very poor prognosis compared to CVP alpha mutant cases that have a very good outcome. Another group of known mutations in AML are those involving MPM1. Now, in our studies, MPM1 was segregated into four distinct but related groups of uh, patients clusters 12, 13, 14, and 16. These differences in MPM1 clustering could not be explained by either the presence or absence of FLT3 ITD. We do know now with newer mutations that have been discovered that there could be other mutations that are explaining these differences, but those are very preliminary studies and I'm not going to show them today. But when all was said and done, we still had five clusters for which we had no molecular, cytogenetic, or clinical distinction factor that would explain why they were clustering together. And we refer to these as the novel epigenetic clusters. And when we looked at their outcomes, we saw that these five clusters had very distinct outcomes amongst themselves, particularly when we compared clusters two and, and five that had a very significant difference in their clinical outcomes. Now, once we had completed the unsupervised analysis, we wanted to understand what was the differences in DNA methylation between each of these 16 clusters and their normal counterparts, the CD34 positive cells from the healthy donors, in order to understand how DNA methylation was contributing to leukemogenesis. While it would be too much to go into all that detail in this presentation, I do want to point out to you that the changes we found between normal chematopoietic stem cell and progenitor cells and AML blasts did not always entail solely hypermethylation, as the dogma has been telling us that we have hypermethylation of promoters. We are actually finding a significant amount of promoter hypomethylation, and we believe this reflects a difference in the biology of the disease. But beyond any differences in their specific profiles that they all had, we also found that there were specific genes, 45 genes in total, that were consistently hypermethylated in any AML, irrespective of genetic or molecular subtype, and that these genes were all involved in relevant pathways for AML, such as STAT signaling, SMAD incorporation into the nucleus, regulation of myeloid cytokines. So we now emerge the concept of recurrent epigenetic lesions, not just recurring genetic lesions. And when we looked at whether this methylation was biologically relevant, we found that about 80% of these genes were silenced as expected to by the presence of abnormal methylation. We now have some in vitro studies that are beginning to show that these do play a role in myeloid transformation. So to summarize this part of the talk, we've shown that unique and distinct DNA methylation patterns characterize distinct forms of the leukemias. We've shown that DNA methylation captured information that was missed by gene expression and cytogenetic studies. We've identified novel epigenetically defined subgroups of AML with distinct clinical behavior. We identified recurrent epigenetic lesions that affect almost all AMLs universally. And we found that there's also a significant aberrant loss of promoter methylation in a subset of AMLs. But how does this aberrant methylation come about? How do they get established? If we look at the case of EBI1 positive AMLs, we see that they tend to subcluster into two different groups. But irrespective to which of those two groups the EBI1s belong, 
they all have a marked hypermethylation profile compared to normal CD34 cells. And when we looked at the promoters of those genes, we found that we could find the EVI1 binding site at those promoters that were abnormally methylated. We looked to see, and we found that we could actually find EVI1 physically bound to the promoters that were becoming abnormally methylated. So we hypothesized that maybe this oncogenic transcription factor was bringing the DNA methyl transferases to those promoters. And we found here shown for DMT3A, but also for DN DNMT3B, that EBI1 can be in co-immunoprecipitated with a methyl transferase, showing that when it goes to its promoters, it's likely bringing the abnormal DNA methyl transferase presence to that promoter. But that, which had also been shown similarly for uh, PMLRAR and for AML1 ETO, is probably not the only mechanism. So let me go back to those five novel epigenetic clusters. After we described these five groups, Tim Lay found in his resequencing studies of the whole genome of a patient that there were mutations in isocitrate dehydrogenase 1 or IDH1. So we went back and we did a mutational profiling of our patients, and we found that all our patients carrying mutations in either IDH1 or 2 were clustered in two of these novel epigenetic groups. So what is IDH1 and 2? IDH1 and IDH2 normally catalyze the reaction of isocitrate generation, alpha-ketoglutarate generation from isocitrate. Now, that isn't a wild-type condition. When these enzymes become mutated, they are capable of actually going backwards in a neomorphic reaction in which they synthesize 2-hydroxyglutarate from alpha-ketoglutarate. When we looked at the DNA methylation profiles of these, these type of AMLs, we found that whether we compared them to wild-type AMLs or to normal CD34 cells, we always found them to be markedly hypermethylated and that that hypermethylation correlated with silencing of those, those genes. When we put IDH1 or IDH2 in a cell in vitro, we find that not only it generates the 2-hydroxyglutarate, but it also induces hypermethylation of those cells. So how does this come about? Well, we looked at a different enzyme that has also been recently described as mutated in AML. That is TET2. TET2, which hydrolyzes the demethylation of cytosine by generating 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, is an enzyme that is an alpha-ketoglutarate dependent. And when we looked at whether this mutation ever occurred in patients with the IDH1 or IDH2 mutations, we found that they were mutually exclusive. If we put TET2 in a cell, we can, let's see if I can point this. If we put TET2 into a cell, we see that it induces the generation of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. And when we put it in the presence of wild-type IDH1, I2, we see the same generation. But when we put it in the presence of mutant IDH1, we see that that is abrogated, showing that mutations in IDH1 or 2 can interfere with the function of TET2. And when we generate, we induce loss of TET2 function, we see a similar increase in 5-methylcytosine as we had seen with the mutant IDH1 and 2. And their DNA methylation profiles in primary patients are also hypermethylated and, and this correlates with downregulation of those genes. This signature is about 60% overlapping with the IDH1 and 2 hypermethylation signature. So we now have a model where, under normal circumstances, IDH1 and 2 generate alpha-ketoglutarate, which is used by TED2 in its demethylating reaction. However, when IDH1 and 2 become mutant, they no longer generate alpha-ketoglutarate, but instead they generate 2-HG, which interferes and poisons the cells, which no longer can demethylate 5-methylcytosine uh, to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. So to summarize the second part, we've so we showed that epigenetic profiling actually identified a subtype of genetic AML prior to the description of that mutation. That mutations in metabolic enzymes can lead to aberrant hypermethylation patterning, 
and that mutant IDH1 and 2, as well as loss of TED2, can lead to impaired myelite differentiation, which I didn't show you now, but it's been now been shown in vitro and in vivo as well. We've also seen that oncogenic EVI1 is capable of recruiting DNMT3A and B. And we now propose that these mechanisms represent new opportunities for de developing th targeted therapies. We can both target the interaction between EVI1 and DNMT3A, as we're doing in the lab, and several companies are now developing small molecules that target the mutant, but not the wild-type form of IDH1 and IDH2. And in the last minute, I'd like to show some transcriptional and uh, translational applications for the use of DNA methylation. We tried to see whether we could use DNA methylation to classify patients into either high risk or low risk. So we went back to our cohort of 344 patients and we randomly divided them into three groups, a training set, a test set, and a validation set. The training set was used by our computational bioinformatics group to try and build a model that was capable of predicting clinical outcome in the test set. So after tenfold cross-validation and many different things and using the computer to train and learn, we came up with a 15-gene classifier that we then applied to the validation set blindly and we assigned labels to those patients which were either predicted alive or dead. Those those labels were then given to a statistical group who then looked at the actual outcome and told us how we had performed in predicting the clinical outcome of the patients. And this is how we did. Both for overall survival and event-free survival, we could separate two groups of patients that were either predicted alive or dead in a very statistically significant manner. And when we put our methylation classifier in a multivariate analysis with known risk factors for AML, we found that it was still significant with a hazard ratio of 1.29. We then went ahead and we validated this group in yet another independent cohort now consistent of close to 400 patients from an independent multicenter group. These are all patients from ECOG's E1900 clinical trial. And we found that in this independent cohort, we could still predict patients that were going to do well from patients who did poorly. This was still significant, and the hazard ratio was still significant here, though a little bit lower. So in summary, we identified a 15-gene methylation classifier that was predictive of overall survival in an independent patient cohort and confirmed as an independent risk factor when adjusted for known covariates. We validated the predictive power of our classifier in a patient cohort from an independent cooperative group. And we are currently working on translating this predictor into a clinical set setting with an assay that is not based on microarrays. And with that, I would like to thank all the collaborators that were involved in all these studies, particularly our friends from uh, the biostatistics and computational biology department, our colleagues from Erasmus and ECOG who provide us with all the samples, our collaborators from Memorial Sloan Kettering, where we have uh, collaborated with the IDH1 story. And last but not least, least, all this work was done in Ari Melnick's lab, and the people highlighted here in red are the people who actually did all the bench work. Thank you very much.